You know, the truth is that, that we all need joy. And we, we want joy. I mean, I, I love to laugh and feel happy and joyful. I love those feelings. And, and honestly, I, I want more of that. And it really encourages me to recognize that God wants me to have joy too. He really wants us to be joyful people. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 15 that he was teaching the things that he was teaching them so that his joy might be in them. See, God wants us to be joyful, but not with the joy that is just our own joy, God wants us to be joyful with the joy of Jesus Christ. God wants Jesus' joy to be in us. And Jesus said that he wanted them to hear what he was saying so that his joy would be in them and so that their, that their joy would be full. God's desire for each one of us is to have God's joy in us, so much so that we are full of joy. You just couldn't put one more ounce of joy in me. I am so full of joy. That's what God wants us to have and experience. And here we live in the middle of this world that is a broken place, where at times it just feels like that, that evil is unfairly Winning out. I know that's not true, but it just feels... I mean, when stuff happens in our lives, in our world, like happened this week, it just, it just feels sad. And yet God wants us to have joy. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 22 that they would have grief when he was crucified. When they saw Jesus taken from them and crucified on the cross, that they would be sad. But he also said to them that they should not remain sad and they won't remain sad, that they would be able to rejoice because they would see him again. And he said, this is the last thing he said to me, he said, and your joy, no one will be able to take from you. See, God's plan for us is that we have joy that is His joy filling us and that nothing in this world can take that joy away. Nothing. That's God's plan for us. And today's story is a great invitation into that kind of joy. We pick up the story with Mary and Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1. Mary has arrived at Elizabeth's house and upon Hearing Mary's greeting entering the house, Elizabeth exclaims, Blessed are you among women. And then she just gives all this joyful testimony about how amazing it is that Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, has come to visit her. She's just full of joy, so much so that she, that the Bible actually describes this situation. Elizabeth says that the baby inside her is also leaping with joy. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of joy going on in this moment. And then Mary, after Elizabeth stops with her joy, Mary starts in with her joy. And you got these two ladies who are just screaming out about their joy in the Lord. It's an amazing scene of wonderful joy. I want to read what Mary says in Chapter 1, verse 46 of Luke. Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. And he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and, and, has, and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. 
as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. So Mary gives this great proclamation of joy, and she begins talking about her joy related to what God has done in her life, having regard for her, showing her favor, what he's accomplished in making her the mother of Jesus, who is going to be her savior, the savior of her nation, and ultimately the savior of the world. And she is so joyful because of those blessings. The blessings that are specifically connected to the person of Jesus. That doesn't mean that she's not joyful over other things in her life. I mean, when, when Mary got engaged, I suspect that was a pretty joyful moment in her life. I have yet to meet a young lady who the day after she got engaged said, that was the most miserable experience of my life. They're like beaming, glowing with joy. I mean, they're excited. So I'm, I'm sure for Mary, that was a joyful moment. I'm sure that she had joyful moments living in Nazareth, growing up as a little girl and becoming a teacher. I'm sure there were joyful moments with her parents. There were lots of things in her life that provided joy that we would call blessings from God. And, and, and a lot of things in our lives create joy that are blessings from the Lord. You and I have, we have lots of possessions. We have lots of experiences with family and relationship. We, we, we have jobs and opportunities around us. We have lots of blessings in our life, our health, our life, that provide us joy in experiences. We experience joy through those things. But what I love about what Mary says is that her joy really centers around the blessings that are connected to the person of Jesus. I love that because what Mary is exclaiming, what she is proclaiming is joy that nothing can affect. See, see, when Mary says, I am joyful in God and what he's done to me, she's talking about the things in her life that are bringing forth joy that nothing in this world can affect at all. And that for her is a source of her joy. And you think about your life and the things that you have and the blessings you experience. If you define your joy, if you think that the avenue for joy is found strictly through the proper circumstances of life, you got enough money, you got a good job, you got a good family, you got decent things going on, nothing's really rocky in your life, everything's going pretty well. Things that are bad are at a minimum. I'm joyful. If that's how you understand that joy comes into your life, I'm going to tell you that your life is going to be largely filled with major gaps, empty of all joy. See, the truth is, we live in a very broken world where the brokenness affects many of the blessings in our lives. I mean, this week is a great testimony to that. Blessings just ripped from you. You had no control, no choice. And if your joy is all wrapped up in those kinds of blessings, it will not last. So what we've got to do is what Mary is doing. She is talking about the joy that comes in her life because of the blessings that are tied to Jesus. Here's how I define those. These are blessings that come to our lives through faith in Jesus that the world cannot affect. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you've been forgiven of all your sins. And nothing in this world can change that truth. Nothing. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you have been given the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit every single moment of your life so that you are never without the presence of God and never in danger of God forsaking you. You have God with you every single moment in all that you face and nothing in this world can change that. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
then God has promised you eternal life. And nobody in this world can rob you of your eternal life. God's promised it. And he will deliver it. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then God has given you a promise that he will take whatever happens in this world that threatens the blessings that he gives, that the world can touch, and he will work it and redeem it for something good and wonderful. That is a promise that the world cannot take away. We have so many blessings that the world cannot touch in Christ. And a source of our joy are those kinds of blessings. Now, I'm not saying to you this morning that you should not feel joyful when good stuff happens in your life. It's not what I'm saying. When great things happen, we experience joy, and that's a blessing from the Lord, one that should be enjoyed and acknowledged before the Lord. But what I am saying is that the source of your constant abiding joy, no matter what, has to flow from the blessings that the world cannot touch. That is a source of joy, and that's the pathway to joy. There's no other way to get there. There's just one way, and it's through Jesus Christ and what he does in your life that nothing can touch. So what happens in your life if if this world, the brokenness of this world, just rips the blessings that the world can touch out of your life? What happens? What do you do? Well, you focus on the blessings that the world cannot take away. That's what you do, first of all. You focus on the things that God has done that the world cannot rob you of. And then you make sure that you're seeing your life's circumstances through the lens of what God has said. That's exactly what we see Mary doing. When Mary does this song of praise and joy, she is verbalizing everything God has said and done in the Old Testament. She's quoting from the Old Testament. She's alluding to the Old Testament. It's just saturated with the testimony of what God has said. And she's seeing everything that's happening in her life through the lens of what God has said. That's the only way that we can really believe what James chapter 1 verse 2 says. James chapter 1 verse 2 says, Consider it all joy when you encounter various difficulties, unexpected difficulties. Events in your life that create unbelievable hardship. When you encounter those kinds of experiences, you should be joyful. Now, how in the world can you do that? You focus on the blessings that the world cannot touch. And you see your life through the lens of what God has said. And what God has said is, I can take what this broken world rips from your life And I can redeem it. And I can do something wonderful with it. Because you're not just living for these 70 years on this earth. If you trust in Jesus Christ, you're living for eternity. And I'm going to take care of what's happening with you. Now and forever. So what God does is he gives us all these blessings that nothing can touch. And when these things in our lives Um, that are blessings from the Lord, are touched by the world, God says, I can take what the world is doing to you, and I can change it, I can redeem it, I can do something with it to bring about my glory and my good in your life now and forever. So that in the blessings that nothing can touch, and in the blessings that everything can touch, we can still have joy. We can have joy through those blessings, we can have joy through being robbed of these blessings, because of the promises and the person of Jesus Christ. Mary understood what God said. And if you want to have joy no matter what, then you've got to make sure you focus on the blessings that God gives that nothing can touch, and you focus on what He says when you face issues that take away the blessings that the world can rob you of. If you want to boil it down to just one simple phrase, joy can abound in your life because of Jesus Christ. He is the only way to joy. 
I love how Mary talks about God in this song. Mary talks about the holiness of God. She says he is holy. She says that God is right in all he does. She talks about God's mercy. That God is merciful to the humble. That he's merciful to those who fear him. That God dispenses mercy. He understands how Mary will feel. What Mary will face. He is merciful and he cares about every detail of Mary's life. He cares about the nation of Israel. He cares about the world. And Mary is exclaiming, God is merciful. She understands who Jesus is. She also says that God is just. He can take rulers and bring them down. He can take poor people and put them in a position that they were not previously. He can take rich people and they're proud of their heart and He can bring them to a lowly position. God can make all wrongs right. Amen? I mean, we need a God who is just on a day like this. If we're to have joy today, we've got to believe that God's going to take every wrong and He's going to make it right in His way and His timing. And Mary is saying that God is just. She has joy. She's also saying that God is faithful. He's given these promises to Abraham and all these generations. And forever, these promises are going to be in place that He's communicated to His people. We can trust in what God has promised that He will bring it about. He is faithful no matter what this world does. We can have joy that abounds no matter what. Because of who God is. And so I just want to ask you, Do you know, do you believe that God is holy? That everything He does is right? That no matter what this world does, no matter what kind of brokenness touches your life, that God is good and right and can redeem everything. He's holy. Do you really believe that God is merciful? That He knows exactly how you feel in everything you face, every moment of your life, and He really cares about you? Do you know and believe that God is just? That every wrong will be made right? Which means every tear will be wiped from your eye. It'll all be okay. And do you really believe that God is faithful? That every promise He's made to you, you can experience through faith in Christ. Do you really believe that? I don't know if you're like me, but when life is just kind of going along and everything's just kind of going normal, whatever that is, you know, you're just kind of experiencing life, and then all of a sudden, something unexpected happens. I mean, something you could never imagine. It could be something very small and insignificant. You're driving down the road, somebody cuts you off. Unexpected, didn't think it would happen. It happened, you're screaming at them, as if that helps. You ever done that? Oh, just me? I'll be at the altar this morning praying while y'all watch me pray about that. Or it could be something really big. I mean, as tragic as what people are feeling in Connecticut today. You you may have had things in your life that are so tragic and unexpected that it's just rocked your life and you're broken, sad, and frustrated and angry and confused if you felt those feelings and those moments of unexpected experiences. I know when those things happen in my life that, that there are times when I just, I just let go of joy. I just, I just let go of it. And, and that's what I mean. I mean I let 
go of it. I mean, it's mine to have in those moments. It's mine to experience in the midst of brokenness because of who God is. And I just, I just let go of it. And I get caught up in the anger and the frustration and the bitterness and the sorrow. And all of a sudden, I'm no longer glowing with joy. I'm on fire with anger. I just, I just let go of the fact that God is holy and that everything He does is right. And he can take every single bit of brokenness that I experience and he can redeem it for my good and his glory. I just, I just lose sight in that moment sometimes that God is merciful, that he already knew what would happen. He knew how I would feel. He would knew the brokenness. He knew, would know the brokenness in my heart. And he really cared about me. And I act like I'm alone and who cares about me? I, I say things like David said in Psalm 13. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? My enemies, they look at my demise and they are the ones who are joyful right now. When will you rescue me? And I need to focus on who God is like David. See, David's circumstances in Psalm 13 didn't change. David just focused on who God was. And when he focused on God, he said, he said, I am so thankful for your loving kindness. I rejoice in the God of my salvation. He has dealt bountifully with me. In those moments when I choose to be angry or frustrated or sorry, instead of experiencing joy in the midst of that pain, it's like I just forget that God is just. And that the wrongs done to me, He will make right in His way, which is always the best way. And His timing, which is always the right timing. He's just. And maybe worst of all, I forget in those moments that God is completely faithful. And all the promises He's made to me in Christ, this world cannot touch. See, the reality is that no matter what happens in this life, in Jesus Christ, Joy can always abound to those who want joy. So we have a choice to make. Do you want joy? I want you to look back at Luke chapter 1, verse 56. The passage says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months, and then she went home. So here's the deal. Mary is hanging out with Elizabeth for three months. That's three months of retreat joy to the max. I mean, three months these two ladies are enjoying their joy. They are just going crazy about what God has done. They're talking about it. They're sharing about it every day, three months. They're both pregnant. They're both having these experiences of great joy. This has got to be one of the greatest three-month periods in Mary and Elizabeth's lives. Can you imagine all night, all day, talking about things, sharing about things, running out of words, and just being able to smile, cry, and then smile again. I mean, joy. Nothing but joy for three months. Amazing spiritual retreat. But then Mary has to go home. She's got to go home. And the first person she's got to deal with is Joseph. She's been gone three months. She comes back three months pregnant. You think that's going to be an easy conversation? Not only that, she's got to deal with her parents. You think that's got to be an easy conversation? Then she's got a whole village of people who saw her leave three months before, engaged, not pregnant, Coming back three months later from a different city where Joseph wasn't, and now she's three months pregnant. How easy do you think it's going to be to live in that community? But you know what? 
None of that was a threat to Mary's joy. Because she knew that God is holy. And if God could place the baby Jesus in the womb of Mary, Joseph was no problem whatsoever. She knew that God was merciful and in the painful moments of being misunderstood and not believed that God would know how she'd feel, what she was going through, and he cared about every single moment. She knew that God was just, that all the things that happened in her little hometown, all the things people said, the way people looked at her, all the rumors that were flying around saying things about her, that all that she experienced was wrong. I mean, this is the mother of the Savior of the world. She's treated as an ungodly harlot. Wrong. God would make it all right. Because he's just. And it wouldn't touch her joy because she knew God is faithful. That every promise he's given, he's bringing about in Jesus, the Savior of the world. Joy is real. God wants you to have it. There's only one way to get it. His name is Jesus. You've got to trust him. You've got to make a decision that you will trust Jesus no matter what. And some of you today, your lives are going great. Everything's going good. It's like you're living at Elizabeth's house. Some of you today are actually on the way home. You don't know it, but something's fixing to happen in your life. It's going to rip your blessings out of your life that the world can touch. You're headed home. Some of you today are at home, and your life is really hard and difficult, and some really tragic things are happening right now in your life, and you are right in the middle of home. Some of you have been home so long that you've stopped believing that Elizabeth's house ever existed. Here's the great news about God's joy. Wherever you are, If you're in Elizabeth's house, you're on your way home, you're at home, or you've been home so long, you don't even think Elizabeth has a house anymore. Joy is yours if you want it. Real joy, true joy, a joy that the world cannot take away. But it's up to you. You've got to trust Jesus.